After DOC almost basically tried to destroy my opportunity at marrying my wife and my interstate compact, as well as my home plan, we got it done. And as stated in the last part, if you've been tagging along with this series, they immediately shipped me. And I did not know where I was being shipped to. And of course, wouldn't you know it, I had already been shipped to a level one after being told my entire over 15 years of being incarcerated I couldn't. And then I was being shipped again. When I got to the bullpen at Powhatan Correctional Center, which is where the changeover is, where all the buses meet before you get on the bus that'll take you to your new prison, I looked at the CO. I said, where are you sending me? I haven't been in any trouble. I'm at the end of my bid. I'm already at a level one. Now what? He looked at me and said, you're going to not away work center, which was a row. It's the lowest of the lowest of the it's the lowest of the ones. I went in my entire experience of incarceration from some of the most violent prisons in the Commonwealth of Virginia to segregation whole time over three years combined. I have battled all of these things. I've seen barbed wire fences stacked on top of barbed wire fences. I've literally watched individuals attempt to get away and get caught up in these fences. I've seen people attempt to unalive themselves by tying a sheet around their neck and throwing it over the, because they couldn't take being on these high level institutions. And some of my brothers that I had left behind had to still serve at least 20 years on a level four. And here I was getting ready, not only to walk out into my freedom, but being shipped to a level one institution, the lowest of the lowest of the low. And I'm not going to lie, it was a shock to the system. I could not find my way. I was grateful for the ability to go out onto the wreck yard and lift weights. And there was a cow pasture directly behind there. And I could watch the cows and zone out when I listened to my music. But overall, the institution was depressing. I remember walking into that camp and wouldn't you know it, a few things were going on. The phones were controlled. Most of the guys were coming straight from jail, which means they were not going to receiving and they had no experience in prisons and any respect that I had acquired while being away, that meant nothing to these guys. They were 18, 19, 20, getting ready to start their prison sentence. Or when they were born, I might even, I, what, I had already been in prison in some cases. I don't know. But they did not care. Everything that I had added to my reputation, my resume, whatever that had kept me out of situations and circumstances was gone immediately when I went down to this low level. I knew nobody. I had never been on a prison where I knew nobody, y'all. And, and that in itself, after you've been locked up for that amount of time, is damn near impossible. But here I was. I was on an island. I remember telling my wife... I'm not going to call you that many times. I'm focused on getting out the door. I've only got a few months left. And she agreed. Of course, it saved money. And it took the stress off of me in regards to trying to get on the phones because the gangs were controlling them. And I didn't want to deal with the politics on this camp. Every other camp I had been on, I had controlled a phone or been in a phone line. I did not want to deal with the hassle here. I would get in where I fit in. And this worked until one day I had a situation, an emergency. I had to call home. I needed this information. And I looked at the wall and all of the phones were being used but one. And the one phone that was being used or wasn't being used was hanging down. And it had been hanging for at least five minutes. I watched it. Nobody was on it. I walked over. I looked around. I picked it up. Hello. Nobody was there. And typically when a phone is hanging down, it is a, a place marker, but it should be understood. If people are waiting to get in line on the phone and it's just hanging there, nobody's on there. Guess what? A guy like me, I'm getting on the phone. And I remember I called my, my wife now and I said, hey, I got a situation dealing with the counselor. I got to get this information. Da -da -da. And before I could ask my question, a young man came over and said, yo, you know, you got to get off that phone, right? I looked over my shoulder i couldn't believe it in all my years of being incarcerated i had never had a situation like this and no again not because i was some gigantic silverback or was somebody that could take everybody out nah i just had respect what are you talking about i can't be i need to get off the phone you're trying to check me i looked at him i said i will get off when i get off now, of course, immediately after my anxiety was up, I am on go. Fight or flight is all the way kicked in. I told my wife, I said, I love you. I got to go take care of something. She said, what are you talking about? I heard that. I said, I love you. I'll talk to you later. And I hung up the phone. I knew that this was one of those moments. And in my mind, I said, well, maybe this is the closing of this chapter. Maybe this is the last hurdle or obstacle that I have to pass. 
And me and that gentleman, after I told him he would have to come pry the phone out of my hand, even though I had hung up on it already, well, he decided to call me a few names. I called him back in. I invited him to the bathroom because in that environment, that's what is customary. Now, I want to tell you the reason that I did that is, one, I wanted to get him to the bathroom before his homies had seen that he was in a verbal argument with me. They were not on point nor paying attention, and I was a seasoned vet. If I could get him somewhere like the other side of the wall in the bathroom and get him to throw him blows beforehand, that would give me an opportunity to neutralize the situation before the rest of his homies had swarmed in we went for it we went in there and we touched every piece of concrete and steel we could and ironically enough not gonna lie the young boy was giving me a run for the money and it was you know one of them fights where you both get tired and you fucking just hanging on to each other excuse my language i know i just cussed but that's what it was it was bad and I remember as his homeboys and a couple of old timers that I began talking to in the pod broke us up saying, man, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I knew it wasn't worth it. I was mad at myself. I was mad. I was mad. I was mad. But Youngin knew he was in the wrong. I discussed, you know, the issues with his people, his big homie or whatnot. And we all figured it'd be best that none of this stuff happened again. And that was that. I'm not going to go into the details of what the agreement was. And no, I was on the phone that night and the day after and the day after and the day after. Uh, but we had an understanding. And that was it. That was the last um, obstacle or opponent that would come from within prison. You know, I'm at the end of my bid and I almost because the fight could have went so many different ways. And I had seen people like Brother Anthony that I've explained in the earlier parts lose their life two days before going home. And it could have went left. But I'm glad I made it through it because there's nothing else that I could be possibly facing. I've got like two months left. Right. 